There we are. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Honan. I'm a faculty member at both the Graduate School of Education and the Harvard Kennedy School. And it's been my great pleasure to have been part of the faculty planning group for this initiative since inception. So Willis and Todd and Lee and myself. So it's a great privilege to have you here. Thanks to Judy and Cooper and others for support and making it possible for us to get together extra observation of it's an incredibly busy time of year so just that you found the time to come together around uh, thinking about teaching together just means an awful lot to everyone involved so with uh, thanks and appreciation so our, our fourth and final session of this series this afternoon we're going to uh, feature and welcome uh, Nancy Kane who also has been part of this work uh, with us uh, since inception as a participant and really active in much of this work so as you have in front of you, Nancy brought a case in the global health area, and Nancy is a professor of management at the Harvard School of Public Health, associate dean for educational programs, a very skilled teacher and scholar originally in the area of financial and managerial performance of healthcare organizations, and then these days spending a little bit more time on cases and other uh, leadership training in global health. And so around our theme of bringing the world to the classroom or the classroom to the world or however you think about that puzzle, Nancy brings us this afternoon a case that will enable us to model a version of pedagogy and also think substantively about issues around global health and global leadership. So Nancy, with a great appreciation, thanks you for letting us into your case classroom this afternoon. Thank you, Jim. There you go. Thanks. And thank you for going over my learning objectives for me already. Um, I was told to try to bring the world into the classroom and uh, went back and forth thinking about what that meant and this, <laughs> I decided it had to mean a case because that's all I know how to do. Um, I, this is actually a case that was written for our Foundations in Public Health course, which is our core public health course. Um, and those of you who are in public health know this, but public health is actually not one sort of even basic discipline like management, but it's uh, five basic ones, plus any one of them has more than one, like the health policy and management. It combines policy and management into one giant discipline. So it's a very um, multidisciplinary way of looking at the problems of the world that have to do with public health. And so one reason this case has been, uh, one, one purpose for which this case has been put is to introduce people to public health, to the field of public health. So hopefully in the course of discussing the case today, we'll get some sense of what these different disciplines mean and what they do and how they approach problems. Obviously, we wanted to experience a case discussion, even though I know you've done that to some extent, but it's another um, opportunity from a different kind of teacher, perhaps, than some of the people you've had uh, demonstrate case discussion. I mean, I try to train fa faculty in case, uh, leading case discussions, and it really is, everybody has their unique style. Um, and so it really, I think, it helps people to see different ways different instructors um, use case discussion, lead case discussion. And finally, if you want to get technical, you're going to get to learn how to, you're going to critique alternative approaches to malaria control. <laughs> and um, as you know, since my background is in, in business, um, I'm not Diane Wirth and the rest of you who's an expert in malaria control. Um, so we're going to be generalists trying to solve this problem as opposed to taking it from the perspective of, of scientists or uh, people who have spent their life trying to figure out how to, how to cure the world of, of malaria. So that said, um, would anybody, and I know most of you have had the case, but I know not all of you have probably fully read the case. Is there someone who would like to summarize the case in two minutes, sort of what what's the case about and help their fellow classmates who may not have read the case as much. So no one's sitting in the back row near the door and that's who I would have called on. <laughs> <laughs> but I know he moved. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. Yeah, Rose knows the case too. Right. Like nets, nets treated with pesticides, and more recently, 
the use of uh, DDT, which is sprayed indoors, with the idea that if you just spray it indoors, these particular mosquitoes uh, tend to stick on the walls and they feed at night, and that uh, therefore spraying indoors will uh, uh, sort of solve the problem. And yet, on the other side of it, there's many counter arguments to do. Can you really spray this directly? Is DDT going to get into the environment? So there's many issues with doing it. Uh, in addition, from the business point of view, they're organic farmers, and they don't want to have this pesticide now get on their crops because now it's no longer organic. So when they try to do the spray removal, there will be protests. So it's a very controversial area um, where there's not necessarily a clear direction, and I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Rose. So great summary. And Rose has an environmental health background, so she knows more about what DDT is like than the rest of us, um, although I'm sure it, they were spraying when I was a child. I do remember that. So if they took my hair and my blood, I think they would find D-E-D-D-E, -D -D -E, the, the, the metabolized version of DDT somewhere in me. I grew up in Florida, and I was sprayed all the time. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's overhead playing trucks. Right, right. So it, it is in our environment as well, but it hasn't been sprayed in the US for many, many uh, decades. So let's try to describe the problem facing, I can't pronounce his name, Dr. N, the head of malaria control in Uganda, is now facing this problem. He's looking at some statistics from APAC, which is this district, very watery district, um, and in the north, a little, a little bit north, sort of mid-central, but north in Uganda. And they've been trying to do the spray and it, they've had a court injunction from the organic farmers and others who are concerned including political opposition leaders saying you can't do that and you have to stop and now he's looking at the statistics three or four months after they had tried to do the, uh, the uh, DDT and he's drawing some conclusions. How would you define the problem for him? Yeah, Lee? Well, the basic problem is that malaria is all over the place. So <laughs> lots of people, especially five-year-old children. So there's this clinical problem. Malaria kills, <laughs> especially children. Yeah. Or kills the old guys. What's that? Yeah, oh, you're right. <laughs> I'm one over. I'm not used to having so many blackboards. Yeah. And what is that? What happens when they get it? Well, they, they, they're out of work for weeks. It's about 35% of hospitalization. So it also helps work a lot of the health infrastructure. It's not working so well. So it uh, reduces adult productivity because they get sick so often. Uses a lot of resources of the health of the health resources. Huge impact on pregnancy. Pregnancy. What is the impact on pregnancies? Uh, spontaneous abortion and miscarriage. Mm -hmm. So a lot of problems with with maternal with uh, people who are pregnant and and are exposed to the the malaria during pregnancy. Yeah, Todd? Uh, it seems to me his problem is organization. Mm -hmm. uh, because how many other countries have we told have been pretty much successful in wiping out malaria? It's not, this is not a disease that they went, that nobody's figured out how to deal with, but somehow they can't get it organized to make it happen. So be a little more, be a little more diagnostic there. So let's pretend you're, you know, you're talking to Dr. Ann. What would you, what's the organizational problem, the nature of it? Well, I mean, his immediate problem is he's got court orders. <laughs> Are you a lawyer by any chance? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what's the sense? Um, you, you're absolutely right. There's huge political opposition. Is there anything special about Uganda 
because actually in other sub-Saharan African countries, they have been successful at, um, at greatly reducing the um, incidence and prevalence of malaria. So what's, is there something about Uganda that makes the political situation? Well, I mean, it's a terrible history of violence for people who are Certainly they've had civil, a history of civil war for the last, since 1960s, since the 60s. And where would that distrust come from? So APAC in particular, what's APAC is not in the governing tribe, not the governing group. Yeah. Obodi came from, Obo, Milton Obodi, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right either, but Obodi came from there and he had been dictatorial and kind of started the whole problem of what since British independence of creating north-south divides and wiping out populations and starting the whole 40-year uh, process. And then Eden Amin comes along. So it's been a, a tough 40 years. Yeah, Will? So there's this whole, I think a lot of things we take for granted in other countries or um, in Western environments, you know, you, you sort of trust the regulatory structure, you trust the, the quality of the, um, what you're getting from the public health system, and it's probably even more difficult. They, they talk a lot about the, the roads and things like that, but what yeah. would it involve to actually get to some of these resources, um, just maybe an impossible in some cases. So the Is it just roads? So the why do they give the m home packs? Does anybody remember the home packs that the family gets to take care of children who might have symptoms of malaria? Why did they decide to give parents home packs of, uh, of um, the wrong drug, but the, the prior, the, the non-ACT drugs? Why do they give them home packs? Do you remember? And partly it's, dr it's, 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 the, it's the roads. That's partly it. That's part of it. Combination therapy, though. I mean, that's partly the one to control the delivery, since everyone had gone to all types of pony. Yeah. So there's a real lack of supply of effective uh, drugs. They have the ones to which the um, malaria has become resistant. The home packs were actually had the wrong kind of drugs. The ones that they had at home. Yeah, yeah, Jim. I think I would add in this domain the um, distribution of the drug, the treatment. I mean, so I read that uh, the, the pharmacies, if you will, so only a, yeah. a small percentage were licensed pharmacies and a large percentage unlicensed. And then I guess in your field, whatever this would be called, that not everyone was purchasing the full array of treatment and therapy. So they were only buying 50% of the dose of fairly ineffective drugs, both because they couldn't afford it and who knows why else. Yeah, Casey? Can I go back to the organizational, political, and talk about some of the infrastructure issues, uh -huh. the actual, like the CDC brain specifically? Yeah. So this is not only the health, but the public health system, the infrastructure, didn't seem to have the capacity to implement our indoor residual spraying uh, properly. 
Ja, Tamar. They couldn't implement IRS, and they didn't educate population to expect to understand what to expect and to appreciate the properties of DDT and how they had to behave around. Uh, you know, this wasn't just spray the walls, you're done. There's a human component to the treatment. Yeah, Judy. Mm. Well, they actually had done it in a southern province, southwestern province from which uh, Ms. Seveny is from, the current uh, prime, uh, head of the country, and it worked. It's a different. Inform consent in Uganda. <laughs> any any thoughts on that? I mean, is that a separate issue? I mean, is that doctor? You know, what, what is the problem? That's exactly what we're trying to come up with, aren't we? What is the problem? Well, I think it depends. Do they even know the problem is because not just on the uh, environmental diagnosis side, they didn't have good diagnostic, diagnostic tools on the ground. So <laughs> yeah. it was all by self-diagnosis. Anybody got a cough? Oh, yeah, you've got a cough. Yeah. So what does that do for you? So one of the problems is even um, monitoring and evaluation tools they don't, they don't really have, they don't use lab tests, so sort of poor metrics. They have a poor um, surveillance system, as they say in the public health world. They don't really know. What, I mean, what is the quality of the evidence that, that actually the IRS in APAC didn't work? What's he looking at? It's in the first paragraph of the case, so you don't have to float through there. What, what's he looking at for? for evidence that this spraying thing is not working. I, Willis. Well, I, I, one thing that I think is challenging about this evidence is that you go back to the political point about pilot. I mean, they do call it a pilot. They call it the APEC pilot. Yes. So it looks like he's looking at data from one state, yep. APEC, and maybe they're, part of the problem is on, on what scale do you do the, the pilot? Are they trying to do it over too large an area? But it, the data sort of suggests that the at least the number of cases and after. You go later in the case, you find that, let's say, 40% of the homes, you know, instead of 95%, the sprayers were covering only 40% instead of the targeted 95%. And then we hear the ones they actually were targeting, they might not have been mixing the right material or applying it correctly. So in the end, you know, it, it's hard to say that you're actually measuring the impact of, of, of an appropriate test. And I don't know whether the solution is you do a much more narrower pilot on just you know a small part of APEC, but even then if you prove that it works, well you maybe prove that it works if you confine it to you know one square mile, does that mean it's going to work on the entire state? So even sort of methodologically it seems hard to with respect to works, what is it about working that you're worried about? I mean they know DDT kills the mosquitoes. What is it about it working that we don't know if it works. Well, it seems like here we don't know if it's actually, 
Well, it doesn't appear to be reducing cases, but it, there, you're looking at such a large number of homes here that it, maybe it, if it reduced it by 20 cases or 19 cases, that may have been precisely in the area where they most effectively so maybe they need to break it down. The whole province is just too big of an area. Yeah, Rose? Well, it seems to me that the question of did it work is, is really two pronged. <laughs> One is in the ultra scientific, you spray the again, the mosquito doesn't kill. Okay, that may work. There's problems with resistance and other things. But when we're talking about working in this situation, it's an intervention that you have to look in the, in the broadest way. You're going to have some people have to spray indoors. Is that going to work under these conditions? Because what do you need to have that work? Really well trained sprayers, but where are you going to get them from? Uh, you know, who know how to mix it? Houses that don't have uh, that that aren't open on the top. So the point that I think that's important here is that it's not working in this context. You know, it's sort of like a medical experiment where you do something in the lab and then you're shocked when you go to spread it out in the community because it doesn't work to put on paper drugs properly or whatever. So I think in social context, one has to look, is this, is this something viable in this social context, in this situation, in these types of places in Africa? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, it may be work, it may be that the DDT works fine, but this is an open house with a bunch of people who don't know how to, to um, contain it. And actually, a lot, of, and wouldn't even let the sprayers in. And you, and apparently, you need to get at least 80% of the houses for the mosquitoes to really start to die off, because otherwise, they just rejuvenate. Yeah, Lee. Surprisingly, you know, maybe you don't have the environment mixed it up. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> Uh, is that the ethical issue, or do you mean the, what by environment? Environmental, you know, what, what are the effects of using DDT on the environment? Ah. Uh, so that would be one of the reasons for political resistance? Part of the problem, you know, it's so, okay, so this kills malaria, and what is it going to do to everybody's skin and everybody's, you know, well, what are the what, all the biological results of the DDT and people and the birds and the birds? What is it on humans? What is it? What is the effect on humans? What is the effect on humans? It's a potential carcinogen. It's more likely to be an antigen disruptor. Oh, he's saying it, it interferes with the um, endocrine cycle. Anybody um, know how to read epidemiological data? Don't 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 worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to quiz you on it, but if you read the studies that were in this case uh, about the effects of DDT on human health, um, the risk, uh, it's a very, it's the, um, whoa, 20, you know, I, I didn't print it out the way you did probably, 29 and 30. Can anybody take a look at the risk ratios and confidence intervals and tell me, Judy knows. Your case stops at 24? Oh, mine go it's exhibit 13. So I had. You. What's the risk? What's. Odds. Wow. At one. At one. So those are relatively more recent, I believe, because uh, we tried to collect all. Actually, we had you know Russ Hauser, who's an endocrine disruptor person, teaching this case, um, and I, apparently the risk ratios are not overwhelmingly high if you've been exposed, even for endocrine disruptors. But they think there is some causality to some types of cancer. But it's not. But it's very low. It, it's very, it doesn't knock your socks off and say, "Wow." this a problem, actually, is that here you have a pesticide that has less effects on the human, but it lasts forever. It may have subtle effects on the endocrine, and it has a lot of effects when it gets out into the, the 
environment where it lasts a long time in terms of birds or whatever. And that's why we don't have malaria here because we spray PVC all over the place. We wiped it out and it had a big impact on the environment. That's where Asylum Spring came in. And then we stopped using it here because we've gotten rid of it. It kills birds. But we don't know if it hurts people in any hugely, any scientifically justifiably, you know, proven way yet. We have hints that it might be an endocrine disruptor, which can cause uh, problems with your, your reproductive system. But um, we don't know. We know it's not overwhelming evidence that there's a human health component to it that we can really measure yet. Now, it doesn't, there can be all kinds of reasons why we can't measure it. Shells. It gets concentrated in lipids, in fat, but it does not, you know, I'm just saying the data, the way, and why is it, why do you think the data might not capture health, human health effects? Hard to associate. It could be underpowered. Maybe not have enough cases. You see, there's 100 yeah. cases, 150. Maybe they just need to have a huge study to de detect the difference, the, the uh, elevator risk. Cape Cod. <laughs> and why would, why would, yeah. Uganda. Well, it, it, yes, and Uganda actually didn't spray for 40 years, I think. But, but where would you find the long-term effects? Well, the U.S. <laughs> I mean, the U.S. did eradicate you know, malaria by spraying DDT while I was growing up and Rose was growing up. So we've got it. And, you know, it's, it's a, it doesn't go away. So you would expect the long-term exposure effect that the U.S. sampling isn't necessarily going to throw you off, unless it's an acute exposure thing, and then you'd think, yeah, you'd have to go to a place where they're actively spraying. So one, but I think one of the big problems with DDT is we know it point kills birds, but it's really hard to detect the human health impact, and it has been. And people are doing all kinds of studies to try to get at it. But then when you get to a place like Uganda, if you live in Uganda, what is your risk of dying of malaria <laughs> versus your risk of having a health impact from DDT? And that's where the, you, know, you see the quotes in the case about people saying, you know, some of them saying, we care more about birds than we do about our children. You mean by imposing it? Yeah. So back to the ethical issue, right. that without without informed consent. You get resistance. I mean, the resistance yeah. that leads to the injunction is one really anticipating long-term environmental damage, not acute toxicity or long-term lasting damage. Mm -hmm. It's not. They talk about infrastructure issues, which relates to this question: Can you implement? Mm -hmm. But they're really going to the kind of things that you suggest that you down here. Yeah. Right. The kind of organic disposal. Absolutely. So there's this organic, I mean, uh, the organic farmer problem. And whether or not DDT is bad for human health, it's really bad for the economy of the, that's based on organic farming. And the person, whether, you know, whether you can prove it or not, people don't want to buy or, you know, it just does, it flunks the test for being uh, qualified. Yes, it's in the, uh, it's in the case, I think, 57% of their exports were agriculture, and, and, and their number one in Africa was organic exports for organic farming. So it's a big, yeah, big part of their economy. 
is organic produce. And APAC is actually one of the places where a lot of organic farming happens. It's also got the worst rate of malaria in the country of Uganda. Hmm. Gee, we haven't solved this problem yet. Uh, yeah, Allison. <laughs> She did, but who's paying for this spraying? <coughs> did anybody pick that up? Yeah. Who's paying for the spraying in, in APEC? Right now? Yeah, no, I mean in the case. Yeah, but long term, like paying in what sense? Well, no, I meant who paid, literally, who provided the money for yeah. APEC to be sprayed? George Bush. Our country paid for this. There's a subtext. I don't know if you want to go to that. Well, go ahead. This is rely. You always take the experts in the class and take whatever you can get out of them. <laughs> I mean, going back to, I mean, under the political, there's this presidential. This spraying, which is very localized, indoors, uh, theoretically that's supposed to work, but I'm not so sure how good the evidence is for that, and I'll pose that to you to answer to other people. But the subtext is getting back to Rachel Carson, and I'll tell you the paranoid subtext, because the Wall Street Journal came out with an article that uh, those people undermine the environmental movement and to uh, show that pesticides and chemicals were good because we have too much regulation here because we don't regulate our chemicals either the way uh, uh, Europe does. So there is a whole subtext of controversies and debate between the, a lot of people in the environmental movement and those uh, corporations and industry who want to do spraying, who want to do engineered foods. And you know you have to spray certain pesticides. Just to try that job out. Monsanto, you know, has certain seeds. You have to use a certain pesticide and all that. So there's this whole underneath this. There is this incredible subtext. That's all. I can well, say. certainly rumors. Um, yeah, Willis, you want to respond to that? Subtext is a sort of imperialist Western uh -huh. coming yeah. in. And I think about was it fairly recently in Nigeria where health workers that were giving vaccines to children were being killed. Yep. And they were using these vaccines to actually infect the population. And, you know, HIV treatment, I mean, there's so many areas where that skepticism coming in. And I think that if, if they don't truly feel they own it as a country, and then even regionally, if it's if it's only kind of run and owned and led by the Southerners, uh, and there's, it seems like there are enough other areas that you don't have much trust. <laughs> the local farmers 
Right. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I can imagine feeling really scared about this. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like almost like a conspiracy. It, the, there might be a real conspiracy, not just an imagined conspiracy. Oh, you mean the way they, so yeah, I, I, I don't know that the people in APAC knew this was a presidential malarial initiative. Oh, I'm talking about vaccines. Yes, okay, so vaccines, but I mean, I, but you mean, you're saying, um, but I think the reason that in Nigeria they had the problem was people thought the polio workers were instruments of Western imperialism and perhaps thought that the polio vaccine was a Western invention. And, and and so 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 one of the challenges I think besides individual you know individual compliance and behavior is individual comprehension of you know just their whole understanding of malaria and the intervention possibilities and where they're coming from and you know all this intrigue and you know it, it's very hard so that's part of Dr. N's problem isn't it is that this confusion out there about why are we spraying and the equivalent is less comprehension and more belief. Belief, so yeah. You can comprehend what I tell you, but if for whatever reason you have cause to disbelieve me, then it doesn't matter what you understand. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So there's a lot of a lot of just lack of trust that has translating into a failure, to, a, an unwillingness to suspend disbelief. Around, around the nature of this uh, intervention. Point, and there was a line in the case, right, of the metaphorical fake drug. Yeah. That in some cases, the trust factor, whether you <coughs> work with the providers or not, yeah. in fact, you might not even be getting the right treatment. But given how prevalent the use of those non-licensed drug houses is, is that a quest question of trust or just I guess I was looking at the line where it declared the drugs to be fake, so it wasn't deception, or at least by the line in the case, it said mm -hmm. that there was the prevalence of the not reputable treatment itself, and I take the point on the distribution. Yeah, uh, apparently that is a big problem, that there are a lot of drugs that are just, so, so much of it's in the private distribution system, and nobody is regulating them, and there is a belief that a lot of those drugs are not, and I'm sure they're not. There, I mean, there's a lot of, potential corruption going on in this country. Yeah, Judy. So where are you? Which? Uh, yeah, it is hard to find. It depends on which, you have to use the second map. Yeah. Yeah, you it's so the northern Uganda has one rainy season from May to November. Correct. Peak malaria season is about four to six weeks after that. Right. Peak malaria is between in December and January. That's correct. The pilot starts in April. Mm -hmm. He picked April, which is right before the beginning of the rainy season. And then the, the peak malaria is after the rainy season. So the idea, I think, was to kill the mosquitoes dirt and have them not, you know, not be active for a few months. So he called the whole thing off. So well, he didn't. Well, he got, 
Yeah. <laughs> The case? I thought it was the case. I think the point is, the point is you need some kind of a model of what the predictions are when when the rain and when the mosquitoes come and have some have know what the baseline is over the course of the year for yes. compare the number you get in any given month. Okay. One of the problems in many developing countries is they don't have good surveillance systems so that you could have that kind of record. Uh, and, and the numbers he's looking at, as Judy's pointing out, they're not adjusted for the seasonality. They're not adjusted for potential deforestation projects going on. They're not adjusted for in, in and out migration of the population. It's just a number. Not to mention the fact that we've already pointed out that a case is not a case until it's been confirmed by a lab test, and hardly any of them are. And something like uh, you know, 80% of, of malaria complaints aren't malaria. So they don't know. They just don't know. Now, does that mean they shouldn't spray? Does that mean, what does that, where does that take you now? You're Dr. N. Where does? You can't tell if spraying helps. <laughs> right? and, and, and by helps, again, we go back to the whole chain of things that have to work in order for the, the pesticide to kill you. We know the last step works. Mm -hmm. So you can't know if you're having an effect if you spray. What would you do then? So you're, OK, now, now I want you to, you're, you're no longer a Harvard professor. You're a Ugandan malaria control unit officer. And your responsibility is to stop malaria, reduce the new cases, Try to get the level of and you know the level of prevalence in the in the in the country lower, so that they can regain this lost productivity and stop killing their kids. What would you do? It's October two thousand eight. You got those numbers coming through. You're not allowed to spray DDT anymore because the court's taken it away from you. What would you do? I mean, you could quit, but I'm not gonna let you quit. Yeah, tomorrow. Let's take a look at the, ah, so one, I know, option one is to try to increase uh, the um, insecticide treated net use, right? And what is that chart? I'm going to find the right number. Well, let's take. Well, let's, let's look at the um, uh, exhibit. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have brought my reading glasses. 11. <laughs> and let, tell me, what, the, what does it tell you? It's got several parts to it. There's ownership. There's where they, bought, where they got them. And then there's use by risk popula various populations at risk, including children and pregnant women. If you, if you look at those exhibits, you know, you want a real world case. What does it tell you? I mean, I feel like this is saying that it would actually be very cost effective way to do it. Tell me more. What's saying that? Is Exhibit 11 telling you that? Right. So if you look at Exhibit 11. Right. So in the number of households in the rural areas, what, per have, what percentage have any mosquito net in the rural? Uh, I'm saying starting the distribution program. Right. So like, then the question becomes, how many households do you have to Let's take a look at Exhibit 11B and tell me where most people are getting their nets. <laughs> Mostly they're buying them. And actually, I think he did. I think that was part of it. But they didn't seem to get to, they did not seem to be distributed for free. Even has one. Rural areas. Yeah. And among the poor. And then I, the behavioral piece of this, too, I think is really tricky. I mean, you give everyone net, but are they going to use it consistently? Are they going to use it properly? Um, 
know, how you monitor that. And I can just see these nets piling up places. But it's or in other projects. Things. Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. But I, and I mean, that's the other thing we just don't know at all in the case about. You even said that there was something that worked in the South, the DEP. Well, yeah. why did it work there and not here? And so why? I mean, I don't know. Is, is it because there's different infrastructure or there's less of these political infights or whatever? Less rain. But I think you'd have to solve that before jumping to the conclusion that, well, the nets are going to be better than the rain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, Casey? Okay. At the very least, the nets take care of many of the concerns that were mentioned with the problems, right? Providing people with nets is not going to do a dramatic harm to people in the city. Um, and ideally, you know, if you're not having to allow a person to come into your home and spray something, right, that's sort of a different level of trust required, like you need to, people need that they're doing what they're doing in order to be getting what they get, and so this happens, I mean, maybe somebody would have greater confidence that that's really what they're getting. Yeah, David, any thoughts on net use and why so people? Don't you want a public education program no matter what source you're in? Yeah. For instance, you, if you had to develop broad public attention, you could start with net use, but you could transition to other solutions in the long term. Let's come, uh, let me come back to that public education issue for a minute, but I wanted to go back a little bit to the nets. Has anybody ever slept under a bed net here? What's it like? Yeah. Uh, anybody ever slept under one in a hot, humid climate? Yeah. <laughs> and what happens if you have to go to the bathroom? That's the problem. <laughs> Apparently, you know, people get out from under them to go to the bathroom and they get bitten if it's highly endemic. But, and a lot of people get hot and they just throw them off. And so there's some, there are some issues about just the way people use them, I think. That, that, I mean, we've had, I had a lot of Nigerians in like one of my classes where we taught them, and they just hate them. I mean, they, they, they had, one woman said she made a dress out of it, <laughs> but she wouldn't sleep under it. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're not that comfortable, you know, to really live under in, in, a, in a way. But, but they do work in some countries, so it's not to throw that out at all. It's just that there are some real behavioral and compliance issues that go with them. Around the public education program, it seems one would also need to set up um, a good experiment. And so far, the only way of telling somebody how to do that is if they're data about it. So that sort of thing is the uh, new piece of research, too. Yeah, um, so, so you're saying before you do this, you want to have For monitoring and evaluation, some sort of surveillance and monitoring evaluation system before you do anything, because otherwise you can't tell if you're being effective. Yeah, Allison. Yeah, I think that that is a good idea. Learn from other countries, and I mean, some of their neighbors actually have been successful. In in so. There is something going on. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, Todd. Uh, I don't know how you do this, but <laughs> the nets needs some local social structure. <coughs> if you can get some leadership of the local social social structure, you can do a lot. So instead, of, I mean, instead of the government doing an education program, you might want to engage. Uh, the local social uh, structure leadership, like the witch doctors and the the community workers and the people who people trust, because they obviously aren't going to trust you coming from um, the capital of the country into, into APAC. Yeah. One of the other things that I think is becoming apparent when you look at the, what you need to do in order to get these things to be effective is you need to build a local consensus and get everybody on board. So either everybody's going to be using nets or everybody's going to be doing yeah. allowing the spraying. Yeah. Um, but informing the people of the benefits and drawbacks Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, Eleanor? Um, somebody was uh, <coughs> looking for social um, <coughs> structures already established. I believe that we 
Uganda has the best um, AIDS fighting set up. Mm -hmm. yep. Sort of piggyback on the AIDS. Yeah, Allison. Yeah. Sort of the beauty salon store. Yeah, you can get women in the beauty salon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm also wondering about these agricultural um, folks, and if there's some way to either, um, you know, if you're doing this one-time spraying, to either literally pay them some compensation, or is it at a certain time of year? I don't know enough about the harvest cycle and when these crops will be most endangered, but it seems like they're a huge part of the political equation here. Mm -hmm. They've got a lot going. Mm -hmm. So you need a political strategy of some type to in involve the various stakeholders, both the agricultural people as well as some of the political opposition for other, you know, the consumer advocates and those who really don't trust um, the central government at all, which is a big, I mean, meanwhile, by the way, the, how long does that take? <laughs> yeah, it's great. You know, meanwhile, kids are going to keep dying in, in APAC, uh, which is the, I think, the struggle they face is this, it does, it does have a huge, uh, impact on the population. Um, I'm not sure how much longer I should go before we switch to um, um, talking about teaching, but um, what you've done in defining this problem, this is very typical of a public health problem. It's multidimensional, and if, if you just hit on one of them, you're not going to fix it. So you really have to know a lot more um, subject or work with a much more interdisciplinary team to even imagine uh, that you've defined the problem well enough to actually be able to intervene on it. So this is a very common uh, type of public health problem. Um, I don't, uh, and Rose and I were talking earlier, I don't know the solution. <laughs> um, I do know that um, right after October of 2008, Dr. N got put in jail for, uh, he was accused of diverting uh, public drug supply into private use. Um, and then he got acquitted about three months later. We were going to call him and try to do an online long distance thing, but we decided the prison wasn't the right place to have that interview. Um, but anyway, he got acquitted. But corruption is also endemic. I mean, it's a terrible problem here where people are constantly um, taking bed nets. I mean, why were they buying them in the market instead of being given them uh, when they clearly had been given a lot of money by the government? So there's a huge corruption problem that, that's in here, too. But then all these other pieces. Um, you know, what is the effect on the environment? How do you educate people? How do you change individual behavior? How do you get a political consensus going? All these skill sets, how do you communicate this kind of risk to people who are not very well educated? Uh, how do you interpret the data? <laughs> All these skill sets are required for anybody to solve any public health problem that, uh, of the big ones that, that face the world today. Um, and, and so that's why our school is so fascinating, actually. I mean, I'm not. Uh, as I said, I don't have an MPH, but it's just fascinating to hear I, all the different perspectives come in and start talking about these problems. And you know, it blows your mind when you start to hear the different ways that people envision and articulate these problems. Um, the other thing that did happen after he got out of jail, I think um, 27,000 organic farmers lost their um, licenses to sell their produce and basically went out of business. Uh, I think they're still struggling. I don't think they've figured out what to do. Um, they're looking for a vaccine? Are they looking for a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, maybe 10 years they'll get one, but meanwhile, you know, you're, you know it's, yeah. You know, one of the yeah. problems just hearing this case that, you know, because DDP stays in the environment so long, if, if you went back to the, the procedures for doing it and the person really sprayed it and it really kept it inside, then it wouldn't get out if you really had the procedures right and it wouldn't contaminate the crop. So a lot of this has to do with their procedures. And then once it gets out, it's like the genie out of the bottle because yeah. the DDP is going to stay for years in the environment. So it's just going to really undermine the 
But I mean, again, I think going back to Todd's point, you know, there's something wrong with the whole infrastructure here. I mean, this infrastructure is not robust enough, is not good enough to do this, yeah. to implement it well. Um, and, and, well, you could, I mean, you could try to move the whole population out of APAC for it. But, you know, it's really very fragile infrastructure. The civil war of all, all those years really made it even much harder. The economy's just starting to take off. They finally had two, three years of peace. And they just, you know, but they they don't have the infrastructure in place to, to make this happen. Um, so they really are still stuck right now, I think, with a pretty big malaria problem. Don't know when it's going to resolve. Um, if I, if it had been, you know, if we'd all been there to try to advise him, I think you're absolutely right. You know, you, given the level of distrust and the wars and all the <laughs> problems that went on, you probably would have to just try to go one witch doctor at a time, one community council at a time through through a local approach and get people to buy into a big enough area where you could actually get 85, 90% um, spray, and at the same time, get uh, the, the, the ACT drugs put in home packs, because you also want to lower the, um, you know, the ongoing acute infection so the mosquitoes don't keep finding new, new bugs to pass around. And that's the way it tends to work. But it's very, very hard to pull that off in this kind of a setting. Yeah. Oh, it's a mess. And they kept spraying the other spray. It had no effect. But it did, it did, they did this in other provinces, and it worked. So there is something about APEC and the fact that maybe there's a lot of distrust. Maybe there's a lot more um, resistance in, the, in, in the, maybe a higher endemic level, maybe more puddles. They have brick making. They have different things environmentally that create lots of pools of water. There's something about APEC that they didn't understand, and they haven't been able to, to get it to work. So um, yeah, Lenny. Oh, it's been going on for centuries. Okay. Sickle cell anemia is, is my, I mean, I, I think they get sickle cell. I think sickle cell makes you, doesn't it make you? Um, Some people get resistance, and they, they get sickle cell, which makes them more able to tolerate malaria. Tolerate the malaria. They've adapt, the population has some adaptation, but they're still losing thousands of children every year. And they still have kids who are, you know, have, um, because of the, either in, re, in utero or right in early infanthood, uh, have malaria and have uh, uh, brain damage. And, and they still have adults who get sick three or four times a year and can't work for days. So it, they just, they've just been, you know, they've been slogging along with it, you know, and in Civil War and all the other things, well, if you're starving or you're being shot at, you probably don't, malaria is not your first priority. But now they've finally reached um, some level of peace, and they're now saying, well, our biggest scourge now is, is malaria. Does that answer your question, or am I... Um, They didn't, I mean, a lot of people don't. Sickle cell and large families. Sickle cell and large families. People who are carriers for sickle cell are real. The parasites can't infect right, no, them. Can't get in the red blood cell. But if that's true, then you would imagine that over the centuries, the people left would be the ones who. The other reality is, I, the other thing I've understood about malaria is it's constantly mutating. So it can, you know, infect people who might have immune, you know, it can, apparently it constantly mutates. So it's it's and the, and the way that it gets into your it gets into your system is just constantly um, adapting to the environment in which it finds itself. Diane Worth does a great lecture on this on on how on the genetic makeup of this. Get you I mean if I, we're way out of my league now, folks. But you can actually get into the genetic makeup of these of the she's done their DNA strands or something and found the part of their DNA that lets them adapt very rapidly, like flu bugs, you know, to their environment. So there is something also about the way malaria can keep infecting, even when you'd think people would be immune to it as a, as a herd. 
But that's a great question. I mean, again, and it brings in the whole science and genomics and all the other pieces of malaria that come into play. And then we have lots of people working on it at my school. Well, thank you. I, we, I'm sorry we didn't solve the problem. <laughs> but you did a great job of defining it.